Hey guys, Tiberius here. The Terran Empire is one of the preeminent political powers in the Milky Way's Alpha and Beta Quadrants in Star Trek's Mirror Universe. A repressive, expansionist government dominated by mirror humans, Terrans, the Empire rules over its subjects with an iron fist. Like the United Federation of Planets in the Prime Universe, the Terran Empire's main space force is Starfleet. Indeed, one of the more engaging aspects of the Mirror Universe episodes for Star Trek fans is pointing out not only the differences between the two realities, but the similarities as well. Besides the mere existence of parallel organizations, the connection between the two universes is strengthened by inter interactions between individual ships and even individual people. In this video, I'd like to focus on the history of Terran starships and how they compare to their counterparts from the Prime Universe. Let's get started. In the opening title sequence of the two-part Enterprise episode, In a Mirror Darkly, we're treated to a super-condensed history of human warfare, as opposed to the normal opening titles, History of Human Exploration, following a showcase of various naval vessels, planes, tanks, missiles, and submarines. The first Terran warp ship displayed is, of course, Zephram Cochran's Phoenix. In the very first scene of In a Mirror Darkly, we see an alternative take on first contact between humans and Vulcans, first featured in the film Star Trek First Contact, as one of the Vulcans from the survey ship to Plana Hoth greets Cochrane with the Vulcan salute. Cochrane pulls out a shotgun and kills the alien astronaut. Cochrane and the other people in his complex in Bozeman, Montana, subsequently board and raid the Vulcan starship, stealing their technology and gaining a leg up on their prime universe counterparts, as well as other mirror civilizations. In the normal opening titles, the starship SS Emmett is seen peacefully flying over the moon, probably sometime during the early 22nd century, not yet equipped with impulse drive. By contrast, the opening titles of In a Mirror Darkly continue their dark display of Terran violence with an attack by the ISS Emmett on the lunar colonies using what appear to be photonic torpedoes. Likely half a century before this revolutionary technology was introduced in the Prime Universe. Also, the attack strongly suggests that Mirror mankind by the turn of the 21st and 22nd centuries was still not united under a single banner. Of course, the same is also true of United Earth in the Prime Universe. It didn't fully coalesce until 2150, but this is this is even more severe. So named in various non-canon and production sources, the Emmet, a 130-meter Ganges-class frigate, is normally capable of speeds up to warp factor 2, or 8 times the speed of light. At this speed, it would take two years to reach Vulcan, and just over half a year to reach Alpha Centauri, of course, these figures do not include cooldown periods, so the real journeys would likely be longer. Supporting a crew of nearly two dozen, Ganges-class vessels are also equipped with polarized hull plating, as well as plasma cannons. In the Prime Universe, this class, also referred to as the Warp Delta Starship Refit, is featured in the background of multiple Enterprise episodes as an escort, and in the novels, goes on to serve in the Earth Romulan War. More ubiquitous throughout the depiction of Mirror Starfleet in In a Mirror Darkly is, of course, the NX class. In the Mirror Universe, NX class ships are referred to as battle cruisers and are the pride of the Terran Starfleet. The Enterprise is the Terran flagship at the beginning of the episode and is under the command of Captain Maximilian Forrest. The exterior of the ISS Enterprise is virtually identical to the NX-01's prime counterpart, save for the Terran Empire logo and massive yellow decals on its hull. The starship's interior is also virtually identical, although it's more dimly lit, with additional wall markings to indicate it is a Terran vessel. The ship's computer also has a harsh, masculine voice. While in canon, the only other NX-class starship we see in the Prime Universe besides Enterprise is the NX-02 Columbia. In beta continuity, we learn 
that at least 16 NX-class starships are built during the 22nd century. Six of these, built between 2151 and 2156, carry on the naming tradition first established by NASA's space shuttle program. Enterprise, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavor. These names are confirmed in Michael A. Martin's novel Beneath the Raptor's Wing. But multiple other sources also include the NX-07 Intrepid, NX-09 Avenger, and NX-16 Curry, all built late during the Romulan War starting in 2159. Funny enough, the ISS Avenger, the NX-09's mirror counterpart, is already in service by 2155 in Enemir Darkly, and is destroyed during Jonathan Archer's power struggle for the Terran Imperial Throne. Between this and the aforementioned photonic torpedoes, it's clear that, once again, certain areas of Terran military technology are decades ahead of the Prime Universe. By gaining access to the Prime Universe USS Defiant, brought to the Mirror Universe through an interphasic rift created by the Tholians, the Terran Empire is able to gain even more of a leg up on its prime counterparts. The details of how the Defiant were acquired are, of course, classified, although we do see these events play out in the second part of Enemir Darkly. The Defiant's technology, being a century more advanced, presumably helps the Terran Empire conquer other major powers such as the Klingons by the mid-23rd century. And as we see in Discovery, the Terran Empire has a new flagship, the ISS Charon, a humongous ship the size of a city. The Charon is essentially a massive planet killer with a palace on top. Ex Astra Scientia has calculated that the mobile space station's length is approximately 9.6 kilometers, or 6 miles, though the Voth city ship, with its 11 kilometers, or 6.8 mile length, and considerably greater mass, likely gives the Charon a run for its money or rather, Terran Imperial credits. And speaking of bad guy flagships, Darth Vader's mobile base of operations, the Executor class Super Star Destroyer from a rival franchise, could smoke the Charon for breakfast, being 19 kilometers or a mind-boggling 12 miles long. The Charon, an Imperial vanity project likely built instead of Earth space dock in the mirror universe, is powered by a so-called mycelial reactor, which utilizes the mycelial network. The mycelial network is like- Mycelial network! <laughs> Remember that. The reactor consists of a large central orb that harnesses exotic energy, creating hypergravitational and magnetic fields. By the way, exotic energy is often invoked in real-world scientific theories regarding how wormholes could work. So the Charon using exotic energy to tap into the mycelial network does have a basis in theoretical physics. Although there is still the mushroom thing, but that's that's probably a story for another time. The orb is located outside of the ship's superstructure and is protected by a containment field at the heart of the vessel. Much like the spore drive itself, the Charon's drive technology is ultimately unsustainable given how it poisons the mycelial network, and the Charon is destroyed in 2256. By the 2260s, top-of-the-line Starfleet ship designs come to more closely resemble their Prime Universe counterparts, signifying a loss of some of the reverse-engineered technology from the Defiant. Of course, even earlier, we saw equivalents to the Crossfield-class USS Discovery, as well as the Cardenas-class, the Walker-class, and several non-Terran starship classes. Among the other differences between the Prime and Mirror Shenzo, besides the latter's inclusion of the Terran emblem, is that the ISS Shenzo has more armed guards guards, agony booths to keep people in line, and updated lateral vector transporter technology that had been recently phased out in the Prime Universe. According to various Star Trek novels, the ISS Enterprise NCC-1701 
first featured in the seminal original series episode Mirror Mirror, serves as Spock's flagship until he becomes Emperor in 2277, after which it falls under the command of Kevin Riley and then Savick. The ship remains in service until the Terran Empire falls at the hands of the Klingon Cardassian Alliance in 2295. 75 years later, during the time of Deep Space Nine, a different defiant, the NX-74205, has its own mirror counterpart under control of the Terran Rebel Alliance. While the ISS Defiant lacks a cloaking device and has different internal furnishing, it is otherwise virtually identical to the Prime Vessel. It was constructed based on specifications of the USS Defiant acquired in 2371, and the warship proves of crucial importance in fighting against the Klingon Cardassian Alliance at the Battle of Terak Nor, representing an important boost to the Terran's fighting power during the Terran Rebellion. In examining the history of Terran starships and how they compare to their Prime Universe counterparts, an important question comes to mind. That is, does war itself help advance technology? Well, in my view, the answer is both yes and no. For starters, it is undeniable that the first two world wars helped advance certain areas of military technology. For instance, the first tanks entered service during World War I in response to a stalemate that had developed at the Western Front. Beforehand, tanks existed merely in concept and as mock-ups. And while both tank and airplane technology significantly improved between the two world wars, it was only with their mass production and use on the battlefield that many military technologies were proven to offer superior firepower. Famously, the nuclear bomb was only developed under the Manhattan Project as part of the U.S.'s involvement in World War II. Even though nuclear fission, first discovered by German chemists in 1938, had made the bomb at least a theoretical possibility. And of course, everything about the Apollo program only existed because of the Cold War. Indeed, the Apollo program is credited by many as having accelerated the development of computer technology by at least a decade, as government investment in microchips and memory helped drive costs down, leading to the PC revolution of the 1970s. So it seems like war unequivocally moves a variety of technologies forward. But think about this. If it hadn't been for the two world wars, then millions of people would not have died, and many of them would have gone on to contribute to various scientific fields that suffered during the world wars. Likewise, the Terran Empire's brutal subjugation of its member races and hyper-focus on conquest has surely resulted in some technological breakthroughs from the Prime Universe being sorely missed. On Earth, instead of investing as much money in weapons of mass destruction, more funding could have gone towards building rather than destroying global infrastructure. Yes, we would have likely taken longer to develop nuclear weapons, but given their destructive potential, is that really so much of a bad thing? I mean, that's that's what a prime universe human would say, not, not I, a proud servant of the Terran Empire. And it's also well documented that World War II disrupted the development of television, which of course has been an incredibly transformational technology. Of course, it can be reasoned that the specific progression of events in the 20th century, bloody as it was, has led to a world order that has been largely beneficial to humanity, discrediting eugenics, accelerating decolonization, leading us to space, and more. But all of these things probably would have happened without the world wars. They just might have taken longer. And we shouldn't go waging wars just for the sake of it, hoping we'll get some tangential benefit out of it. While war has undoubtedly moved certain technologies forward, it's also held us back in certain areas as well. And airplanes, cars, computers, all of these things might be more advanced without the world wars having soaked up so many R&D dollars. Yes, peace moves technology forward too. Again, both rules of acquisition, 
War is good for business, and peace is good for business. Of course, again, that's something that a prime human would say. I, on the other hand, say, long live the empire. Whoa, whoa there, partner. Hey guys, real Tyler here. Sorry about that. Looks like Tiberius got a little carried away with all of the uh, evilness. Not to worry though, we've sent him back to his home universe through the interdimensional portal in my basement. In any event, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. Big thanks to the man himself, Fleet Admiral James T. Kirk, one of my top patrons on Patreon this year at the $100 level for his input on the production of this video. If you want to support the channel directly, becoming a patron or member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, where you can get a sweet t-shirt like this, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Uh -huh.